I'm very glad to welcome everyone to our morning service. Uh, we are meeting this morning in the smaller of our two congregations in the Catherine Street building. Catherine Street used to be called Cow Street. So if you'd lived about a hundred years ago, you would, I would have been welcoming you to Cow Street Church. It was because the common ground was about a mile up the down Patrick Road and most families in the town had a cow or two and the herdsman came down each morning and drove the cattle up to the commons and then brought them back in the evening. Also, for a long time there was a huge spinning mill opposite the church. It has quite recently been knocked down and a lovely new development of houses known as the old mill built on the site. So that's a wee bit of history about our town this morning. You are all very welcome and we hope that you will enjoy our service. It is Lord's Day, Sunday the 14th of June 2020. As you have already heard, today I'm in the Catherine Street Meeting House of Killyleigh Presbyterian Church. Welcome to members both of Killyleigh and Carrie Duff congregations, and also to any other visitors who have joined us. And may the Lord bless us as together we worship him. I want to say a very big thank you to all in Carrie Duff Congregation who worked so hard to organise the drive-in service on Tuesday night past. It was good um, that we were able to meet together, at least in some sense, uh, in order to worship God publicly. And it was encouraging that so many um, people in vehicles came along. And please pray, therefore, that God will bless the word that went forth. Would members of both Carrie Duff and Killyleigh congregations please note that I'll be on holiday from tomorrow, Monday the 15th of June, until Monday the 29th of June, inclusive. Uh, if any pastoral emergencies crop up uh, during that period, would you please contact the Reverend Jonathan Curry, Minister of First Sinfield. The contact details are available from all the clerks of session. So let us now worship God together. Our call to worship is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So let us wait upon the Lord, even as we pray to him. And Karen Maguire will now lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, our Father, we come together today to give you praise and honour your name. Creator God, we praise you for the beauty of the world we live in and all the life on it. Almighty God, we give praise that your faithfulness surrounds us. God, we praise you because you are the one and only Lord, there is no other. 
We praise you, Father, because you are the Lord who heals. We praise and honour you, Father, because you are a God who answers prayer. We praise you, Father, because you are a merciful God who never forsakes us and you are gracious. God, our Saviour, we praise you because you are a loving God. God of light, we praise you as you are our light and our salvation. You are our help and our deliverer, O Lord. Praise to you, Lord, our provider. You generously provide for all our needs. We praise you, Father, for being a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Father, we give you praise, glory and honour for being a generous God who did not even stop short of giving your own Son, Jesus, for us. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your marvellous wonders. Lord, we come to you now humbly to confess our sins. You know each one of us personally, Lord. You know our individual struggles with fully obeying you throughout the last week. We have sinned, Lord, in thought, word and deed. When we haven't loved others the way we love ourselves, forgive us, Lord. When we've been less patient, kind and gentle with those around us at home or work, forgive us, Lord. When we've lacked faithfulness, goodness or discipline, forgive us, Lord. Lord, as we confess, we cling to your promise to be faithful and just with us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for Reverend Smith and his ministry to us all. We are grateful that you give him wisdom, discernment and strength to teach us your word. Thank you for the digital ministry teams in Carrie Duff and Kelly Lay, for the time they take to prepare and deliver the message. Lord, continue to use their gifts to bring blessing to others. We give thanks, Lord, for the steady decrease in cases of coronavirus and pray that as lockdown measures are gradually eased, there will not be an upsurge in the rate of infection. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities for families to keep in touch through technology and to begin to see each other face to face again as restrictions are relaxed. Lord, protect our families physically, emotionally, spiritually and mentally. Lord, we pray that our hearts and homes be filled with hope, peace, joy and unlimited blessings. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sarah will now sing her first piece. Let's all sing together when I survey the wondrous cross.
Zena McAllister, who is one of the clerks of session in Killyle Presbyterian Church, will now lead us in our prayers of intercession. And then Sonia Curlett will read to us from God's Word. We are coming to a king. Large petitions with us bring. For his grace and power are such, one can never ask too much. Dear Heavenly Father, we indeed come to you this morning, bringing our requests to you, knowing that you will hear them and will answer them as you see best for us. As the coronavirus situation continues to affect us all, we bring before you our National Health Service staff, those working in hospitals, nurses, doctors, administrators, paramedics, domestic staff and ambulance drivers. We think too of the staff of our many care homes and district nurses, the staff of our local surgeries and the many carers in our communities. Lord, keep them all safe as they carry out their duties. Father God, we ask you to comfort and bless all those families that have lost loved ones as death has visited in their homes, in care homes and hospitals. May they know your love surrounding them at this sad time. We ask too that an effective vaccine against this epidemic may be quickly found. Give wisdom and power to all working in laboratories as they seek a cure. Bless the many folk who are isolated, shut in, not allowed callers. May they soon be allowed visitors, especially visits from their children and grandchildren. Grant your peace to all who are lonely and fearful at this time. Be with those who have lost their jobs due to closures of businesses and factories. Bless those who are finding it difficult to live due to lack of money. Be with all, seeking to bring assistance in the various situations and communities. We thank you for the work that Dr. Henry, our past moderator, has done. And we pray that you will guide and direct the new moderator, Dr. Bruce, as he begins his year in rather difficult circumstances. Bless all our missionaries. 
working in difficult situations, especially in countries where the coronavirus is rife, like Brazil. We think also of countries like India and Yemen experiencing lots of difficulties at this time. Bless our representatives at Stormont and Westminster. Guide and direct their thoughts, words and actions and grant wisdom and integrity to all world leaders as they seek guidance for the many problems they are facing. Spirit Divine, attend our prayers. Make a lost world thy own. Descend with all thy gracious powers. O come, great Spirit, come. Amen. Today's reading is found in Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 to 19. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark, and he sent the wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to receive until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. So Noah came out, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds. Everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark, one kind after another. This is the word of God. Amen. I wonder, have you ever been on a cruise. I'm sure some of you have. And if you're going on a cruise, you're probably given an itinerary. And when you look at your itinerary, it may say for one day or perhaps for two days, it may say at sea. That probably means that you leave one port very early in the morning and then you head out to the open sea and you're there all day long. Maybe you're even possibly um, there for the next day as well. You're out at sea until your ship docks at the next port. During that period at sea, you see nothing but sea. There's nothing around you except endless miles of water and hopefully maybe blue skies above you. 
Now for a day or two, that may be pleasant enough. On a cruise, you're maybe lying on a sun lounger, licking ice cream, working up a tan. And that's enjoyable enough. But I wonder how you would feel if that went on day after day after day. And let's suppose you weren't lying on a sun-kissed deck, but rather you were lying under leaden skies. And not just under leaden skies, but from those leaden skies, let's suppose the rain was pelting down like stair rods, day after day after day, um, maybe for 40 days and 40 nights. And let's suppose also that your ship just seemed to be drifting endlessly, that there was nobody actually steering it. It wasn't being given any direction. Your ship was just drifting aimlessly on the surface of the water. And what's more, maybe you didn't know how long that was going to go on for. So this was the kind of experience that Noah and his family may have had. Yes, Noah had been told that it would rain for 40 days and 40 nights. He knew that. But in an overall way, he didn't know actually how long he and his family and the animals would be on that ark. Now, of course, it was much better living on the ark than drowning in the water. But Noah and his family were in a kind of a lockdown, weren't they? They were in a kind of a lockdown in that big boat. A lockdown that didn't last for just a few months, but a lockdown that lasted for over a year. During this lockdown period we've experienced owing to the coronavirus pandemic, during this lockdown period, just think of some of the issues that have cropped up for some people. Family issues, people maybe getting on each other's nerves, mental health issues, a lack of um, interaction with wider society, lack of structure to some people's lives and some people's days. Well, imagine then what it was like for Noah and his family on the ark and all the uncertainty attached to that. It surely took not just saving faith on the part of Noah, but it took sustaining faith. It took continuous faith to cope with that situation. So let's take note then of some of the important things that emerge from the passage that was read earlier from Genesis chapter 8 verses 1 to 19. So first of all then, first of all, we're told here, God remembered Noah. That's what we're told in Genesis 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. God remembered Noah. Now, you might be inclined to think, well, what's so remarkable about that? Well, the point is this. Noah and his family had been floating on top of the water in the ark on the endless sea for almost a year following the onslaught of the flood. Yes, he was a man of faith, blameless among the people of his time, as we're told previously in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. He was a man of faith, but he was human too. He was human. And the sea is a very lonely place, especially if your boat is the only boat in sight. And during those months, faith or no faith, Noah must have wondered whether God had forgotten him and his family and the animals as they floated like a big bit of insignificant refuse on the great tide. Did Noah perhaps wonder if he was 
abandoned. And maybe there's someone listening to me today, and that is precisely perhaps how you feel. Abandoned. Does God seem to have forgotten you in the midst of the difficulties perhaps that you're going through, the trials perhaps that you're going through? Do you feel abandoned? Well, if that is the case, then the eighth chapter of Genesis is particularly for you because its point is that God has not forgotten. The chapter begins with these words, but God remembered Noah. Yes, there may be times when God seems remote to you, when you think God has forgotten you, but you must cling on to the knowledge that he has made you, he has sent his son to save you, if you have trusted in that son, then his spirit indwells you. And that triune God who has made you and saved you and indwells you, he will neither forget you nor abandon you. Remember the words of Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 to 16. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Or remember again what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So, then, even in the lean times, even in the mean times, even in the dark times, when it seems and feels as if God has forgotten us, even in those times, we have to echo the words of Habakkuk, who said, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. So God remembered Noah. Then secondly in this passage we see this. God removed the flood. Genesis 8 and verse 1 tells us he, that is God, he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. The writer of Genesis, namely Moses, is probably intentionally here, intentionally drawing a parallel between Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 and Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. Genesis 1 verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And Genesis 8 verse 1 says, He, God, sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. In both cases, the word for spirit and the word for wind, for wind is the same word, ruach, in the Hebrew. And the point is this, the Lord God Almighty is in control of all things. Yes, he's in control of the weather too. Or the weather forecasters may come on our TV screens and tell us what's going to happen in the weather tonight and tomorrow and next week and why it will happen. Cold fronts and all kinds of information like that. But that does not still deny that God causes all of it to happen in the first place. 
Psalm 148 and verse 8 tells us this. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds do his bidding. When the children of Israel, you remember when the children of Israel found themselves trapped at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's troops were bearing down upon them and they were in a sticky wicket. We're told in Exodus chapter 14 verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. And of course, this same Lord acts in a similar way in the New Testament. You remember Jesus out on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples in the boat, and a furious storm arose, and the disciples were frightened, and they thought that they were forgotten and abandoned and they said to Jesus do you not care and you remember Jesus got up he rebuked the wind and the waves he said peace be still and there was a great calm and the result of it all was this they asked each other who is this even the wind and the waves obey him. So then when you find yourself in the midst of life's storms, and any of us at any time can find ourselves in the midst of life's storms, when you find yourself in the midst of life's storms, keep trusting in the Lord. Sometimes, of course, we cause our own storms. Sometimes we, we contribute to our own storms and difficulties in life by our own sins and iniquities, by at times our own stubbornness and foolishness. But there are other times when God allows storms to happen in our lives. God allows storms to happen for his own sovereign purposes. And he will still the storm and remove the floods of difficulty in his own appointed time when those floods and storms have fulfilled his purposes. Just as the flood fulfilled its purpose of judgment upon a rebellious earth in the days of Noah. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know the voice of him who ruled them while he dwelt below. Yes, God removed the flood. And then thirdly in this passage, we see that God renewed the earth. God renewed the earth. In this chapter, as you well know, Noah sent out the raven at first, which did not return because um, when the raven went out, it probably began to eat and pick at the dead carcasses of other animals that were floating about on the surface of the water. So it did not return. Then he sent out a dove, which uh, did return. He sent the dove out again a second time, seven days later. And verse 11 of Genesis 8 says this, when the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. Now this dove, this dove with the olive leaf in its beak, is often taken as a symbol of peace. And I'm sure you've seen pictures of that. Pictures of the uh, lovely, gracious, gentle dove um, with the olive branch in its beak. You've seen pictures of that. But actually, I think it makes more sense to take the, um, the dove and the olive leaf, to take it as a symbol of renewal. Renewal, the renewal of the earth. As the waters began to subside, 
and the tops of the trees began to appear covered in their foliage, um, or as the, in this particular case, the leaves of the, the olive tree began to appear, it was a sign that the earth was in fact being renewed. The old earth, the pre-flood earth, the old earth had been drowned in the flood of God's wrath and judgment. Now a new earth would emerge, a new earth, and it would be populated and repeopled by Noah and his family. Likewise, when the Lord comes again to judge the living and the dead, he will inaugurate a new heaven and a new earth, populated by those who have trusted in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, only those who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ will people the new Jerusalem. Are you therefore sure that you are trusting in him? Are you sure of your place in the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven? and the new earth. Oh, won't you be sure? Won't you close in with God's offer of mercy in Christ? Because you see, God's judgment upon sin fell upon Christ, and all who take refuge in him are his people. Make sure then that you are one of his people through faith in him. But not only did God renew the earth, he also renewed his conversation with Noah. For over a year, while on the ark, for over a year Noah had heard nothing from God. At least we're not told that he heard anything from God while actually on the ark for over a year. But now, now God speaks to him again. Verse 15, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number upon it. But there was that extended period when Noah heard, in a sense, nothing from God. Now, you may be going through a period in which God, as far as you are concerned, God seems to be silent. You pray, but the heavens seem as brass. You wonder if God has heard you. What should you do? What should you do in such circumstances? Should you give up? Should you lose heart? No, you should do as Noah did. Go on as you have been doing and wait patiently for God to speak again. Courage, brother. Do not stumble. Though thy path be dark as night, there's a star to guide the humble. Trust in God and do the right. Let the road be rough and dreary, and its end far out of sight. Footed bravely, strong or weary, trust in God and do the right. You should notice, of course, that when God did finally speak to Noah again, Noah obeyed. He obeyed by doing exactly what God told him to do. When God had told him to come into the ark, he came into the ark. When God told him to leave the ark, he left the ark. You see, probably more often, the problem for most of us, the problem for most of us isn't that we don't hear God speaking to us. But rather, we don't always 
promptly obey God as we ought to. We do hear him, but we're not always keen to do what he bids us. May we therefore be like Noah. Do what God tells us to do. Don't run ahead of God's will. Await his will patiently. Don't act without his word. Await his word patiently. May we adopt the words of Frances Ridley Havergill and make her words our own. Master, speak and make me ready when thy voice is truly heard. With obedience, glad and steady, still to follow every word. I am listening, Lord, for thee. Master, speak. O oh, speak to me. So God remembered Noah. God removed the flood. God renewed the earth. And may that same God bless to our hearts this day the preaching of his holy word. Amen. Sarah will now sing her concluding piece. Now join me in singing your name. Now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us this day and for evermore. Amen. When I 
deserve.